It is my great pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Lucio Picciano, who is a who is an architect at AIBC. Uh, Lucio has uh, studied architecture in Italy, Canada, Mexico, and the USA. Uh, he studied at the University of Toronto, where he obtained a professional degree in architecture. Uh, after which he moved to the U.S. and started his career as an architect. In 2008, he established his own small practice in Vancouver, where he has uh, since resided. Uh, he has coupled his design practice with design build and building envelope services. Uh, Casa Lucha in 2015 in Vancouver was the first of his 11 passive house projects. Uh, currently, he's working on a new uh, multi residential passive house building, uh, along with uh, three others that are in progress as of 2021. Lucio is particularly interested in the combination of form, uh, the attainable urban typology, and the passive house approach. Uh, once again, uh, welcome to Ritual Builders Breakfast, and please take it away, Lucio. Thank you, Steph, for, uh, for that uh, excessively positive uh, introduction. <laughs> and Chris, uh, for your presentation, which was excellent, um, that really covered uh, uh, more than just the basics of passive house, and uh, I believe would give everyone a, a really great understanding of of what we're talking about here. If uh, if you haven't done it already, so thanks a lot. And it's actually a really great um, compliment to what I'm about to show, uh, which is more hands on and uh, a real project oriented. So taking uh, everything that Chris summarized and realizing it uh, in two projects that I'm going to show. So I'll start with a uh, six minute video that I condensed for this uh, presentation. Uh, and in, I'm going to show uh, basically four uh, pr single family projects in the within the city of Vancouver. Two of them are quite close to Richmond. Uh, so there's some relation there. So, as mentioned in the, in the cycling video, I'm going to be running through 2 projects. Uh, the 1st 1 is, uh, my home, which is Casa Luca built in 2015. 2nd, 1 is at 5120 Dunbar street. They're both, uh, the same size. They have the same plan, except the Dunbar house has a full basement, which Casa Luca does not. So. That was the evolution from the simple, the very simplest, most cost efficient passive house we could produce in 2015 to the next step, which was adding a full insulated basement into the thermal envelope, which in itself pre presents probably the most complications for building. Um, and perhaps it won't be a challenge in Richmond because, uh, as we know, we're, it's, it's very rare that the homes are built with basements there. However, the slab uh, is still uh, a complex consideration and I'll show a couple options for uh, what we've done and what, what could be achieved uh, in Richmond that's similar to what we do in Vancouver. So generally we're looking at in Vancouver, the typology of one and two family dwellings and this makes up at least 70% of the gross area of the city, uh, which I believe is similar to Richmond, uh, though the main difference being, I think your lots are quite a bit larger. And again, we probably wouldn't have a basement and we often see garages attached to the homes in Richmond. Uh, these will present two specific uh, problems for achieving passive house. Uh, not overly complex, but they would need to be addressed as you do have a connection uh, between the garage and the main house. So there's a thermal bridge uh, uh, connection detail there. And then how do we do the slab cost effectively uh, so we keep it um, as insulated as the rest of the envelope? And we'll show you how we've achieved that in Vancouver. But generally, as uh, as Chris showed in his presentation, we want to stay away from overly complex forms, like we see in the uh, the, the four lower slides, uh, four lower images in this slide. 
uh, as well as the, the middle uh, slide at the top. So we're going away from high articulation, complex roof forms, lots of in and outs, uh, lots of bay windows, uh, projections uh, that are costly to detail and add to thermal bridging. These are the kind of things we're going to start to simplify as we uh, strive towards the path of house standard. And generally that does lend itself uh, to a modern design, uh, but it doesn't have to if you keep your detailing simple. So uh, projects like we see at the top here with the X next to it, <laughs> will be very difficult to achieve uh, passive house um, compliance and they would be excessively costly. You could do it, but this is where we get the comments of, oh, it's, you know, it's so much more expensive to build. So much more expensive to build if you try to replicate a code standard house. But if you, uh, if you simplify the design and the form factor, then it doesn't have to be uh, more expensive than a standard bill. And we have actually proved that on uh, our last five projects where um, in Vancouver, where the, 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 co the overall cost came out to exactly uh, what a code standard uh, build would have been. So moving to the next slide, um, is a brief uh, overview of what uh, Casa Luca uh, was comprised of. Uh, two stories, two full stories with a, a third, half third level and a roof deck. Uh, basically, we achieved uh, the thermal envelope by using two by six advanced framing and four inches of mineral wool on the outside. At the time, the relaxations were not in place for passive house, so we needed to have as thin a wall as possible, which meant uh, closed, full closed cell insulation in this assembly. Uh, that's costly, but it was really the only way to achieve a thin wall uh, on a, and maximize, maximize the allowable area on a small lot. That was the last time we did that because after this project was built, the city of Vancouver incentivized passive houses and made it uh, a lot easier to make up for the area taken up by the thicker walls. Uh, so we've since moved to uh, two by eight construction filled with bat or mineral wool or cellulose, and then the four inches of insulation on the outside. Similar, similarly, in the roofs, we always do exterior insulation on our projects. So they'll either be flat roofs or low slope or even, uh, even some higher slope roofs, but we'll, we'll always use um, either uh, hand framing, TGIs, uh, and then a slope package or full exterior insulation outboard of the sheathing. This home achieved the uh, uh, 0.58 air exchange, so it wasn't great, but it was our first try with untra uh, untrained trades and you know going into it uh, pretty blindly, I would say. So again, here's the um, here's some construction photos of how we did the walls. Uh, we exclusively use advanced framing now for a couple reasons. Uh, one, it, it uh, greatly reduces the wood content in your wall. So you go down from 20, 22% wood content to as low as eight, but more, more like 10 or 11%. That uh, translates to lumber uh, savings, of course. Uh, but it also uh, reduces the thermal bridging within those assemblies. So you can add, you can reduce the wood content and add more insulation into your wall. So when you plug that into the PHPP modeling uh, U-values calculator, it's actually uh, a significant increase. So not only are you reducing the cost of your wall, but at the same time, you're increasing its, uh, its thermal performance. 
So as you can see also, um, to mitigate some of the costs that are uh, that are used in the envelope and thermal performance of passive houses, we've kept the design simple both on the outside and the inside. So basically, uh, it, it, for us, it's not a compromise because we do modern design, but it's a trade-off between adding some um, budget to the thermal performance and reducing it at interior finishes and exterior uh, finishes like uh, projections, uh, cornices, detailing, excessive detailing. So those things can all be pared down to help uh, with the monies that are required, uh, the extra monies that are required towards the thermal envelope. So here's a here's another example of the advanced uh, framing. Uh, generally, of studs 24 inches on center, uh, and we'll have the TGIs line up with those studs. Uh, we can also, when we have the TGIs line up with studs, we can eliminate the second top plate and further reduce um, the wood content. And we can use an inch and a, a quarter fiberboard uh, rim joist as well. So that combination right there gets us to, this is probably the lowest wood content we've been able to achieve, which is at under 10% for sure. I think it was uh, in the end, it calculated to 8%. And if we uh, design windows so they, more or less fit with in, in between the 24 inch spacing of the studs, then we also reduce headers and we can use uh, joist ends as our headers in that situation. So we're getting rid of a lot of wood. And as we see now with how lumber prices have skyrocketed, that's gonna become increasingly important. On, uh, home, on homes or buildings that are uh, above three stories, I think, um, there'll be less of a savings because you likely have to go to a structural select for uh, for the the loads on the first floor, but still uh, compared to standard framing, um, even with that upcharge on the structural uh, select for the probably just the first level, you're still into significant savings. On the right, we have a slide of how our windows are sealed to the structure, so. We want to make sure that the there's no air leakage between the frame and the structure. So we're sealing all four sides, not with backer rod and caulking, but with um, high performance tapes that usually have an acrylic adhesive on them. These tapes will last much longer than backer rod and caulking, be more effective, and um, and can also move with the structure uh, much easier than a back rod and caulking. For any of you who've had to take out drywall, even a few years after a house is built, um, it's pretty obvious that the back rod and caulking doesn't last. Um, it often gets penetrated uh, with knives or uh, other trades, and um, and is just is just not a long term effective solution. The tapes will last. Uh, you know, if not breached, will last uh, as long as the house. You know, uh, studies show 50, 60, uh, maybe not that long, 40, 50 years. Um, so you'll, you will, um, you will maintain the air tightness at those um, junctures much longer with the tapes that we're using in passive house techniques. Once the, the, structures framed, our approach has been an exterior continuous air barrier, which um, we're lucky enough to be able to get away with in, uh, in our climate zone, climate zone four or five. Um, I wouldn't recommend this for the higher climate zones, um, but we're a bit warmer here, so we can push that air, air barrier a little bit inside the wall, as long as we have enough exterior insulation. Uh, I like to do this because it is much easier for the trades um, to uh, to be uh, um, to be effective with their air barrier ceiling. It's also uh, easier to repair. It's easier to monitor during construction, 
And then if you use an exterior insulation approach, like we always do, you're completely protecting it after the fact. So we're wrapping it up. And um, as long as uh, this, the construction manager on site um, is monitoring the situation with penetrations, um, we can be uh, relatively certain that it's going to stay intact throughout the duration uh, of construction. You also don't have to be overly concerned if you do have a secondary uh, air barrier or vapor barrier on the inside if trades do penetrate that because really the exterior air barrier will be the primary one which we're using to achieve our uh, a sub 0.5 air changes per hour. Again, this is a really easy way to achieve thermal free uh, thermal bridge free construction and still have a rain screen screwed over the four inches of insulation. Uh, it, it's quite easy to use standard components to uh, achieve this. We don't need to go into GRK screws or any advanced products. This is all off the shelf components uh, from any of the local suppliers. I'm just backing up a bit here. Another technique we like to use is a, a vertical uh, metal profile, which allows us to actually uh, not install a strapping rain screen system because the rain screen is inherent in the um, in the profile of the metal. We have a one inch uh, air gap there. It's on the slide on the left. The slide on the right, we see we transitioned to a panel system whereby we did install uh, rain screen strapping over top of that insulation to achieve the rain screen. So just some ways of keeping the wall thin, thinner than it would be if this metal was installed uh, horizontally, we would have had to add that extra rain screen layer, adding another at least half inch um, to the assembly width. Doesn't sound like a lot, but on small sites, that's actually every, every half inch counts. And in the end, we uh, we have a simple form. This is the north facing uh, facade. You can see the the windows are small. They're much larger on the south. Which slide on the right is the top floor of the south, which is basically our heat sink. We're we're heat we're we're, we're providing all our solar gain with the south windows, and we've added a small three kilowatt array to the roof, which for this house translates to almost exactly half of our annual total power consumption. So once you, uh, once you optimize the envelope of a passive house, uh, you'll see that it takes very little uh, to power the house after this. And that's why we can, even on a small house like this and a small array, it's totally worthwhile and cost-effective um, to introduce it. Uh, it's not required for the passive house, but you know, you know like I said, it, uh, it easily handles half of our annual consumption. You can see, um, the difference between a passive house on this, the thermal image on the right, there's a code built house on the left and a Kazaluk on the right. You can see the difference in the heat loss. Uh, between the two styles, so it's it's quite significant. These slides show uh, some performance data, uh, which is a, an important point to make, and one that Chris alluded to in his presentation of why do we certify is passive house like enough. It's probably not enough, um, and the reason is we don't really know if we're achieving the performance goals if we don't certify. By with certification, we can um, we can analyze against our model and be quite certain that what we're building is actually achieving what we want. Um, and Kazaluka was our first attempt at this, and and you know over the years we've we've tracked its performance, and I, I don't think it's a coincidence that the modeling is almost spot on for what the performance is. 
is. Of course, there's occupant behavior to account for, but and that and that is accounted for in the PHP model to a certain extent. Um, but for this project and all the other similar ones we've built and monitored, we are within five percent of what the data of the uh, modeling uh, shows us before it's even constructed. So we look at the chart on the top left. The blue is um, is the indoor temperature throughout the year, and the pink is the outdoor temperature throughout the year. And this is with only two kilowatts of heating within uh, an eighteen hundred, a two thousand watt heater within an eighteen hundred square foot home. Sometimes not even turned on, and no cooling. So you can see that I don't know if you can see, but this blue. Uh, the blue line is constantly within 18 and 25 degrees with minimal, um, again, minimal uh, systems uh, affecting that. This is purely uh, from the building envelope and orientation and the, the, um, the passive house approach. Uh, the slide to the right is also showing the moisture content, which we do monitor in a lot of our projects because these are atypical assemblies, roof and wall. So we wanna see if they're actually performing uh, as they're intended to. And you can see the, um, the pink line in the middle is, is generally the moisture content in one of the walls, which is virtually constant throughout the year, uh, regardless of swings in temperature and swings in relative humidity, both in indoor and outdoor. This is a slide of an experiment I did during the coldest week of the winter, I believe, which in 2016, we completely turned the heating off. Outside was minus eight. And for a whole week, we uh, maintained with three occupants and no heating, 20, around 20 degrees Celsius. When the temperature increased uh, later in that week to six degrees and then sometimes up to 10, 12, we're still within one degree of what the uh, indoor temperature is, regardless of what we're seeing out, uh, outside. So very constant temperature, which translates to uh, constant comfort basically in any room and uh, at any time within the house. So moving on to uh, the second house, which is again, the virtually the same design, except this time with a full basement. The technique we used um, to insulate the basement, uh, which I think will be um, important for houses in Richmond, is basically a floating slab. Uh, whether it's a basement or not, the slab on grade needs to be fully insulated. So the advantages of this are uh, a couple. You're using um, your insulation as your form. So you're reducing wood and labor in that sense. And you're generally roughing in um, the entire system within the basement uh, before the rest of the house is framed. So you're getting a step ahead in construction so that when the house is framed and covered up, all the basement systems are in place and the finishes are basically the plumbing and electrical finishes are, are what's left to remain. All the systems are within the slab. So we bury everything in the insulation, in the warm side of the insulation. Sometimes we'll have 10 to 16 inches of insulation below that slab. Uh, so we're able to keep even water pipes um, up higher, but underground and and roughed in in the concrete so here's the step-by-step -step process we used basically the only wood forms that are required in the um, in this slab system are the perimeter for the um, for the main slab then we compact fill within that 
and um, there's two ways we can add our uh, our membrane. Depending on the thickness of insulation, uh, we can sandwich it in between two two layers uh, to protect it, or we can put it completely on the warm side. I like to sandwich it if I can. It protects it a lot better, and I don't have to worry about uh, trades ripping it or the concrete uh, pour uh, breaching the the seams or penetrating it. In this case, we almost always use a 10, at least 10 mil, but usually a 15 mil. And I like to use the, the Perminator. Uh, it's virtually indestructible and easy to seal. And um, once you do this and you do your blow, blower door test, you will see that the basement can have a lot of leaks. So, uh, and and those, those breaches in the, um, in the whole system are almost impossible to fix after. So with the Perminator, it's just an extra insurance against tears, which can possibly be fixed after backfill and after pour. So you can see in the uh, first slide at the bottom, that's the layer of uh, full insulation under the slab with channels left for our, uh, our rough in plumbing. And then we pour the full finished slab right over top of that. And then in comes in the ICFs. You don't have to use ICFs, but it's just a good combination system. Again, very little lumber used for the forms, very little waste. And that whole basement uh, goes up very quickly. And uh, to reiterate, your steps ahead of a standard uh, construction approach for basements once this is in place. So for Richmond and what we're doing in uh, a couple of our new projects, it may sound a little bit wacky, but um, it works. We're doing uh, non-concrete slabs. So if we uh, look at what we just did with the house, pouring the concrete over top of all that insulation is actually not necessary. Um, we could just pour the uh, grade beams, have a perimeter of concrete with whatever load bearing grade beams are required within that. And then the rest of the slab could simply be the insulation with uh, two layers of Advantech, which is a, a tongue and groove um, particle board flooring system staggered, uh, and the 15 mil, um, probably underneath that, but preferably sandwiched in insulation for protection. And then you can screw on, screw down any floor, uh, that you want onto that. Uh, the key, the, the advantages here are a couple. One, we are completely eliminating, um, that concrete, which is a huge, uh, upfront carbon emission. We are reducing the overall cost uh, of that slab. And, um, and it's more efficient. So we're finding this, um, this strategy um, quite effective. We've just done it on one house in West Vancouver or Vancouver West, not West Vancouver. And it was easy for the trades who had never done it before uh easy for the uh, engineers to accept because there's no load on the on the slab and uh no problems with the city so um again i you know i would encourage builders in richmond to consider this if possible because you will save money you'll uh speed up construction and um again carbon emissions are uh a, a huge uh a huge savings in this technique which in Richmond, there'll be a lot of uh, bigger um, slab on grade uh, areas in the projects there, I would, I would assume. Moving up again, we have advanced framing again. Um, and with the continuous air barrier in, in our approach, it's important to get the framer on board with lapping at the floor joists that whatever membrane that is, um around uh the rim joist so you're gonna have a little bit of a nom an anomaly 
uh, on the for the interior vapor barrier where it goes from the inside, it turns around the joist end to the exterior and then comes back in at the floor locations. This is in a scenario where you where you are adding a secondary air vapor barrier. Uh, again, our primary air barrier is the uh, self adhered uh, membrane on the exterior sheathing. Uh, but as long as you're using a high quality vapor open uh, membrane, I would advise one also at the interior, depending on the thickness of, of your wall, just for the, the, um, the extra insurance. And we'll see how that looks here. Um, that membrane I'm talking about on the interior is on the right. That's the Sega Myrex uh, with all the joints taped and penetrations taped, of course. So the trades need to um, uh, spend a little extra time doing a better job of sealing every single lap and juncture uh, at that vapor barrier. Um, interestingly, on the exterior with our uh, self adhere membrane, uh, we're again, we're always in our climate and well, I would in, in any climate zone, we're always using a, a vapor open self adhere membrane unless we had the full insulation value outboard of it, but we rarely see that. So we're using this, uh, the Delta vent essay on this project, uh, the Suprema VP uh, and other SEGA, uh, SEGA essay. Uh, there's a lot of membranes on, uh, on the market now readily available, and they're all generally uh, self-adhered with acrylic and uh, with minimum vapor permeance. So, what we see in the left slide is when you install that membrane on a uh, wood structure that had too high of a moisture content. Um, this was actually uh, a positive uh, mistake because uh, when this membrane went on, it was completely flat. Within 24, 36 hours, it started to bubble out. You can see the blue sky in the back. The temperature went up and the humidity went down. So that wood started to dry up. And you can see that by the bubbling of the membrane. We had three days of this kind of temperature. On the fourth day, that membrane had completely flattened out and sealed back up onto the uh, sheathing. So basically it was an experiment that the vapor open um, self adhere membranes do work i don't recommend installing it when it's a high moisture content like that but it proves that it works and um and it really probably is the best easiest way for trades to achieve um both uh, the water resistance at the sheathing and um a really high level of air tightness on uh, wood frame projects. After that membrane's up and, uh, and you know, uh, as long as it has a, a certain amount of dry, uh, uh, dryness to it, we start the uh, wool sweater, which is what we call it, the full uh, exterior insulation. Um, depending on what your system is, if you have a rain screen strapping system attached to it, or not, depends on how many screws we use to attach the insulation. If we have a, a rain screen system attached over top of that, I usually only specify a maximum of four screws per sheet of insulation. This reduces the penetrations in the membrane and, and the thermal bridging, because again, we'll have the structure of the rain screen over top of it, cinching it down. So it's, it's, not, per, it's not required to, over fasten that insulation. And again, we're talking about projects of three stories or less here. So there's the house uh, totally wrapped. Again, we use the, the technique of the vertical metal, metal siding to achieve a rain screen without strapping. And then on the front portion where we had scorched cedar, uh, we added a uh, UV resistant 
uh, building paper over top because we have a uh, five eighths inch gap between the boards. So they would be revealed. And you can see the channel uh, next to the window where the sliding screen goes in, the track is installed above it. So that's hidden in our hidden in the rain screen of the um, of the cedar clad the cedar cladding that you can see on the slide on the right. So that's the uh, the finished house. Very simple. Uh, you can see it next to a standard cold built a code built house. Uh, much simpler, obviously. Uh, the rear of the house. Um, uh, very modern, very few penetrations. And, you know, just to clarify, this is a, this is a project that was oriented to the West with a new house built right up against it to the South. So it was very difficult. This has been our most difficult building to achieve certification because we had very little opportunity for solar gain. Uh, it's also a design guideline zone in the city. So there are a lot of restrictions on uh, roof, uh, shape, height, um, uh, articulation, co even color. So adding to the complexity of Passivos was all the other requirements of the city. We even had an archeological zone um, at this site. So we had to pause excavation for um, the province to come in and, and just verify that uh, you know, we weren't disturbing anything. So, uh, you know, n not related to what we're talking about, but there can be other <laughs> complexities when building in BC. So if you're doing passive house, you wanna keep it as simple as possible. You don't wanna add to those complexities. It doesn't have to add to those complexities. And the way we build with often with trades that don't even know what passive house is, um, makes it easier for everybody. We're using off the shelf, products we're using standard techniques that only require a couple days on site to get uh new, new trades acquainted with it and it's a very short uh, learning curve to get anybody um who's building currently in in and around city of vancouver on board with this passive house there's really no with the with the uh, supply availability of the technology we have now in vancouver uh, and, and the way we can build these, um, passive houses is really no excuse for not doing it anymore. And it does not have to be more expensive. I would encourage, uh, uh, builders and, and, um, developers when they're talking to clients about, um, you know, possibly going this route, uh, it's important to clarify that there might be some extra upfront costs uh, due to enhanced envelope features, but that must be analyzed over the amortization of the project. You have to take into consideration the low operating costs and the low maintenance. You can't just look at the cost of that wall today and say, this wall costs more than my neighbor's house. You have to look at what that wall is saving you over the entire life of the building and that's the real way to look at the uh any if there are any extra costs of the passive house because over a 30-year amortization that's a significant savings by spending a little extra up front and again we're you know this is none of this is speculation which is why you know we've adopted the passive house approach it's it's all proven the modeling is accurate and the proof is in the pudding. We have very low um, carbon uh, carbon monoxide in the interior. We have excellent um, indoor air quality and stable temperatures. And we, even with a small array, you can see the consumption graph on the right. We have you know uh, very low consumption. So, uh, and, and, and these are not, you know, these are not technologically uh, complex projects. All the details, the details are simple. Um, it, it's, it, there are things we can do now quite easily and they're basically technology proof. 
Um, and if we look at what's happened in Texas last month, this is a great example of why you want to focus on your envelope primarily before anything else. Power goes down. A passive house is basically a heat bank in the event of services going down. Uh, as our experiment showed, you could you could keep the house at the same temperature for at least a week, depending on um, occupant behavior and and you know uh, how that temperature remains outside, with no problem and no discomfort. So uh, disaster proof in in a sense. And just to conclude, um, it's you know it's important to note that uh, most of our zoning in Vancouver and surrounding cities is single family, and it's a it's great that uh, we're starting to move towards passive house for those buildings. But the real efficiency uh, comes when we combine that with up zoning and higher density, which you know, uh, kudos to Richmond, they're, they're going that route. It's a slow process as we see in Vancouver as well. Um, but that's where we really have to go uh, to get, you know, the, all the benefits of combining passive house and uh, morphology of the city and higher densities. So um, that's my little ending, ending comment. <laughs> and uh, thank you for listening. And let me know if there's any questions.